All right. We're going to get this thing going. All right. So uh, we're now going to hear from Andy Weir, who's the author of The Martian. Uh, the Martian is, in my view, the first actual Mars movie. Okay. There's... There's been uh, previous movies that uh, have, um, you know, nominally occurred on Mars, but that Mars had nothing to do with the Mars that actually exists. And the storyline had nothing to do with the actual story of humans taking on the challenge of Mars. There would be basically shoot 'em ups or, you know, variants of the, you know, the haunted house movie. You know, the teenagers go into the haunted house, they hear a scream, they say, let's split up, and then they split up. And one after another get killed. Um, the, uh, okay, uh, no, this movie is about humans to Mars, humans taking on the challenge of Mars, human grit against the challenge of Mars, and fundamentally it says that great message that we can do it, we have the stuff. So I like this movie, I hope it's going to be a great success, and without further ado, Andy Weir. Hey everybody. Yeah, I just, uh, it, it's great. Um, I'm, I'm in LA right now, and I just, uh, just yesterday saw the movie. So, uh, it is awesome. I recommend everyone go watch it. And then I also recommend everyone buy like six copies of my book each. That's, that's how I actually make a lot of money. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the story behind this story, how I ended up uh, bungling into this situation here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then we'll, we'll go from there. We'll talk about the scientific aspects of things, and then I'll uh, open it up to questions. I think I'll probably have to have someone relay me questions from the audience because I probably won't be able to hear you, um, but someone will do that. Um, I think it's pretty cool to have Dr. Zuber in there. <laughs> it's like, hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> We've never spoken before, not directly, and so it's a, it's a, it's a real treat. I mean, as, as uh, any of you who've read the book know, the, um, the Ares mission profile is about 85 to 90 percent Mars direct. So, it's, yeah, <laughs> with a few of my own little changes, I uh, hope you don't mind. <laughs> but uh, basically, um, I started writing The Martian back around 2009. I actually came up with the idea for it much earlier, but you know how it is when you're a writer, you tend to just sit on ideas for a long time until you have that shower epiphany that tells you how to put them all together. But uh, I was sitting around at home wondering how, how could we do a manned Mars mission? How, how do we get the astronauts there? How do we get them safely, you know, how do we keep them on, alive on the surface? How do we get them home? How do we have abort options? How do we maximize the abort options? Uh, you know, how do we minimize risks to the crew? Just the same thing that uh, folks like you sit around and think about all day. I was just sitting around in my living room being a space dork. And I wanted to say, like, how could we do this with the technology we currently have? So don't, you know, not, not for fictional purposes, don't just make stuff up, but actually try to use the technology we have or minor improvements on the technology we have. And, um, uh, what I came up with was the, the Ares mission profile, which, like I said, is very, very similar to Mars. Well, it's based on Mars Direct uh, with a few of my own little twists. And then um, I started to think, well, you know, how do we make sure the crew doesn't die if this breaks? Uh, you know, any good mission plan accounts for failures. How do we make sure they survive if, if that breaks, if these two things break at the same time? And I started to realize that these, uh, this, would, this would make for a pretty interesting story if you actually had all that stuff break. And so I created an unfortunate protagonist and subjected him to all of it. <laughs> so originally, well, we're going to go back in time a little bit further to the, um, well, basically the, the late 1990s. I, I always wanted to be a writer, but I also like uh, eating regular meals and sleeping somewhere other than a cardboard box in an alley. So... When the time came to choose a career, I went into computer programming. And I did that a lot. I mean, I loved it. Uh, I, and I, I still like programming computers. It's, it's a career that really worked for me. It's, I, I really liked it. Um, but uh, when uh, around 1999 or so, 
I got laid off from AOL with about 800 of my best friends uh, when they merged with Netscape, which shows you how long ago that was. And uh, I, I had a bunch of stock options from AOL. And I didn't, uh, I, I, I assure you, I would not have made a wise financial decision left to my own devices. But because I'd been laid off, I only had 60 days to sell those options. So I was forced to sell them during this very narrow period when it happened to be AOL's peak stock price ever. <laughs> so um, I ended up with a bunch of money. And I thought, hmm, I can live for a few years off of this. I'm going to take my shot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a writer. I'm going to do this. I'm, I've always wanted to be a novelist. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a, the great American sci-fi book. And so for three years, I wrote a book and tried to get it published. And that book was not The Martian. You've never heard of it. You've never heard of it because it wasn't very good. It was actually my, it was actually my second book. My first book was in college, and it was so bad even I could tell that it was bad. So uh, I didn't try to get that one published. But the uh, uh, the second one, which was called Theft of Pride, was okay, but it wasn't really that good. And uh, so after three years of not being able to, couldn't get an agent, couldn't get a publisher. It's the kind of standard tale of woe that every writer experiences. And uh, I thought, like, okay, I spent three years. I, uh, I gave my, my life goal dream a shot, and it didn't work out. Now I don't have to wonder what might have been. Now I'm going to go back into software. And that's not a huge failure for me. I really like programming computers. And, you know, I, I had fun on my sabbatical, and I'll admit I spent a lot of time just goofing off and not working at all. So I had fun. I got to basically spend three years of my retirement right in the middle of my 20s. So that was nice, right? So anyway, time goes by and the internet starts to in increase in prominence. People start to use it more often. People can have their own websites. Everybody's got an email address. It starts to really come into its own. And I think, oh, hey, here's an opportunity where I can, I can be creative and I can have an audience and I don't need to get published. I don't need an, an old boy network to make a decision on whether or not my stuff is, is good enough. You know, I can just do it on my own. And if it sucks, who cares? You know, nobody, got, I, it doesn't cost me anything except for, like, a small amount of money to maintain a website. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. So starting around 2000, 2001, um, I started making my own fiction and posting it to my website. I started out with a web comic. I uh, did a couple other web comics, and I started writing short fiction. And then I started writing some serials. And uh, um, I started The Martian in 2009, but I'd actually had a couple of other serials going on at the same time. Uh, so The Martian, my tale of a man stranded on Mars, was uh, concurrently being released chapter by chapter, along with Jack, the story of aliens invading Earth, and Bonnie McKenzie, the tales of a mermaid living in New England in the 19th century. You can still read like the first seven chapters that I wrote of Bonnie McKenzie on my website if you ever want to. I think it's good. It has potential. Anyway. So uh, I wrote The Martian starting in 2009, and uh, I finished around 2012. And during this time, um, I had a mailing list. I had uh, people who could sign up for a mailing list and be emailed whenever I posted a new chapter of something. And uh, by far, everybody's favorite was The Martian out of all the stuff that I posted. Whenever I posted a short story or a chapter of a different serial, people would be like, I'd get, I'd get emails saying like, oh, that's nice, but I was kind of hoping for another chapter of The Martian. So it was really cool because I had around 3,000 readers at the time, 3,000 regular readers, due in large part to um, a short story I wrote called The Egg that was really popular, that drew a lot of readers to my site and gave me a bunch of new permanent readers. But basically over 10 years of writing, I'd accumulated a modest little uh, reader base. And those are all like really scientifically minded people. That means nerds who like, who like are really into the science and the detail work. And um, it was great because as I was writing The Martian, scientific accuracy was really important to me. I wanted to be as, as accurate to the real world sciences as possible. <coughs> Hang on a second, I'm gonna mute for a coughing fit. I'm just on the tail end of a cold, sorry about that. But um, so uh, what was really cool is as I post chapters, I would get email from people who would who would tell me whenever I did anything wrong? So somebody would be like, um, "Excuse me, on page seven, and so on." And so, uh, 
and it was great. I, I called them beta readers because they found all the bugs in the book, right? And so, I mean, I got email from chemists telling me where my chemistry was wrong, from physicists telling me where my physics was wrong, from double E's telling me where my electronics was wrong, and I got to fix everything as it came up. And it was great. So by the end, I had a really, a really technically solid story. Now, I, th I thought that would be the end of it. I thought this is like, okay, this is basically a book that's just written for, for extremely science-minded people. It's a teeny tiny little niche audience. And I was comfortable with that. I, I didn't figure I was writing for anything mainstream. And when I was done, I figured, okay, I'm done. I posted the last chapter. I'm going to move on to other serials and, and, and call it a day. And I started to get email from people saying, oh, hey, I, I love your, um, I love The Martian, but I hate your site. It's awful. And it, it is, you know. And, and uh, so I don't like reading a book on, on a website. So can you, uh, can you just put it together into an EPUB or a Mobi and post that on the site so I can download it and put it on my e-reader? So I figured out how to do that. It's easy. There's just online conversion software that you can get. It's really trivial. So I did that. And I posted it up onto my site and said, there you go. Then um, I got email from other people saying like, hey, I love your story, hate your website, but um, I'm, I'm glad that you have it um, in an e-reader form on your website, but I'm not very technically savvy, and I don't know how to download a thing off the internet and put it on my e-reader. And can you just post it up on Amazon, Kindle, like, you know, self-publish it? So I figured out how to do that. It's not a problem. It's uh, pretty easy. You, uh, I, I used Kinder, Kindle Direct Publishing, KDP. It's nice because it has no uh, personal outlay. You don't have to do any financial risk at all. Um, the, only, the only thing you stand to lose is the time and effort you put into writing your book, and that presumably was something you enjoyed doing in the first place, right? So I, uh, I, I posted it to Amazon, but I could not give it away. I wanted to give it away, but they won't let you uh, have the price of zero you have to have a minimum price of at least 99 cents because Amazon wants to make money, not be a free hosting service for books. Um, so I set the price to 99 cents and then I told everybody, oh, oh yeah, so I set the price at 99 cents and then you post it and Amazon hangs on to it for like a day or two before they actually make it available for sale because they just want to make sure you didn't post a big book full of goat porn or something. Don't judge, don't judge. So anyway, um, once, it, once it showed up and I, I, proved, I verified that you can search it and find it, I told everybody, all right, here's the link to the Amazon page where you can buy it. Um, so you can read it for free on my website or download it for free from my website, put it on your e-reader, or you can, pay Amazon to, uh, you can pay Amazon a buck to put it on your Kindle for you. And which means I was, I was pulling down a cool 30 cents per copy. Yeah. And more people bought it than downloaded it for free by far like way more people like tens of thousands and so uh, uh what i learned from that is um number one amazon has a huge reach into the readership market and number two people are willing to pay a buck to avoid technical hassles um yeah so it was it, it was great and, and it started to sell and it started to snowball and it worked its way up into the top sellers lists of amazon and so that's when it starts to really snowball because you know Someone's like, oh, I want to read a sci-fi book. What are the top 10 in e-books? E what are the top 10 sci-fi? You know, and so that's where it starts to, to, really, uh, to really snowball. And then around that time, I didn't know this, but at the time, um, an editor named Julian Pavia at Random House, or actually Crown, which is a, 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 an imprint of Random House. It's one of Random House's publishers. Um, he, he's an editor for Crown, and he had the book, and he's like, mm, I don't know, this might be good. People are saying it's good, but it seems really technical. It might be just engineer porn. Well, I don't, I, and he was talking to a colleague of his named David Fugate, who is a, a, a literary agent. And he's saying, like, I don't know if I want to read this or not. And David said, well, okay, you've just told me that you're potentially interested in this book. So I'm going to go read it unless you tell me not to right now. <clears throat> and Julian said, yeah, go ahead. So David read it, and he liked it a lot. And then he contacted me and said, hey, do you need a literary agent? And so after three years earlier in life of just getting rejection letters or just ignored outright by literary agents, one comes knocking at my door. So I did some research to make sure he's a real person and stuff. And then, and then I'm like, sure. 
and David's like, great. And he turned around to Julian and said, okay, Julian, how much are you going to pay us for this book? <laughs> so that was pretty cool. And then while those negotiations were going on, 20th Century Fox came for the movie rights. So it was still like when Fox came after the movie rights, it still had not been published as a, as a print book yet. And those two deals, the movie deal and the print publishing deal, were four days apart. So that was one hell of a week for me. <laughs> yeah. So then, um, you know, we went through an editing pass, and it was pretty pretty minor. They, uh, Crown was really happy with the book the way it was, so there wasn't that much to do on it. And then um, it, 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 it released in February of 2014 and uh, got on the New York Times bestseller list. And so that was pretty exciting. Then the movie stuff started to happen. <laughs> uh, originally, they had Drew Goddard, uh, who is a veteran writer. Uh, he's uh, he wrote uh, Cabin or he directed Cabin in the Woods. He wrote uh, Cloverfield. He wrote a bunch of episodes of Lost and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So he's a, he's a, he's a seasoned expert, and uh, he wanted to write and direct the movie adaptation. And so he wrote a screenplay, and um, and they, then Matt Damon signed on. To be the lead and that's like incredibly exciting at that point the studio was really taking it uh, seriously like oh okay it's very likely that we're going to green light this movie up to then they'd been like eh, this is a thing we might someday do um but then drew goddard got offered the director's chair for the next spider-man movie and he loves that sort of thing so he says like well i gotta go do this but enjoy my screenplay and so they're like, okay, now we've got a, we went from having a director and no star to having a star and no director. And then Ridley Scott said, I'll direct it. And the studio said, oh, really? <laughs> so then once it was uh, Ridley Scott to direct, <clears throat> once it was Ridley Scott to direct and Matt Damon to star, everything started falling into place. Um, big name uh, actors and actresses were interested in being part of the project. The budget went up and up. And now we have like a major release coming out October 2nd of uh, this year, The Martian, starring Matt Damon. Hey. Right. And it is awesome, I can tell you. I saw it yesterday for the first time. They, they brought me in and showed me a cut, and it is awesome. It's great. It's very true to the book. Matt Damon perfectly captures the character of Watney. And I was just thrilled. I mean, I was I was choked up. You know, it's it's like the culmination of all my dreams coming true. I mean, Fox brought me into Fox Studios and put me in one of their little viewing rooms that has like you know 50 seats in it, and there were only like 20 people there. There was me, a bunch of uh, a, a few execs from Fox, and then a few people from JPL who they'd invited to watch. It was just this one show, but they'd really set up the showing for me. <laughs> and one thing I love is that like I have my own title placard screen like it you know it shows the stars names and stuff like that and there's a screen to to myself that says based on the novel by Andy Weir and I'm like yeah <laughs> so the first question I usually get is um or, you know before I open it up to questions I'll say oh uh, oh actually I want to talk about the science but I'll just clear this up the first question I usually get is uh what was your involvement in the film Andy you know what 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 did you do in terms of the production of the film well, mostly my job on the film was to cash the check. And uh, I think I did a pretty good job at that. Uh, they, they're not required to involve me in any way. They don't, have to, um, they, they don't have to consult me. They didn't have to do anything. They could have bought the rights and then just gone away and said bye. But um, they chose to involve me, which was really cool. Drew talked to me a lot on the phone as he was writing the screenplay. And when he was done, he sent me the screenplay for, uh, for my feedback. And I gave him a big list of notes, and, and uh, he... Am I back? I'm back. Yeah, I had a little internet chug there. Sorry about that. Um, am I coming through? I'm not seeing any video from you, which... 
but it's okay. If I'm coming through to you guys, that's all that matters. Oh, there we go. There's vid nice video. Hello. Okay, what was the last thing you heard before I cut out? Someone? I cashed the check. Okay. Well, they didn't have to involve me, but uh, Drew Goddard, uh, who wrote the screenplay, he chose to involve me. He talked to me a lot over the phone and um, at, while he was writing the screenplay, and then when he was done with the screenplay, he sent it to me for feedback. He made some of the changes based on my feedback and ignored other changes, that, or ignored other bits of feedback. It's his screenplay, so, you know, he gets to do that. And then, um, yeah, and then they invited me out to watch them film, uh, but they did the they did the shooting in Budapest. Um, the the principal uh, principal production was in Budapest. That's where they did all the studio work, and that was uh, that's too far for me to travel. I don't like to fly, which is why I'm speaking to you here via Skype, and um, so I wasn't willing to go to Budapest. But I, I I'm sure I will regret that. But even now, uh, I I don't see myself being able to fly to Budapest. <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, while they were filming, I would get questions filtered through like four layers of indirection from Ridley Scott. And there would always be these deep, detailed technical questions, which made me happy. I'm like, he cares about this, right? It's like, well, one of the, one of the questions he asked was, um, can we show Mark Watney pouring hydrazine from one container to another when he's out in his, on an EVA, when he's out on the surface of Mars, you know, in his EVA suit? And I'm like, no, hydrazine is really volatile in that lower pressure. It'll boil off. And they're like, OK, OK, OK. <laughs> so they didn't they didn't have that in the movie. <laughs> and so it's really cool that they that they cared about the scientific detail that much. And having seen the movie, I'm very happy with it. I mean, they actually um, they simplified stuff a lot, but they didn't actually simplify the science or hand wave anything. They just did it and then didn't explain it that much. You, you know, it's like, okay, he did this thing. It's scientifically accurate, but we're not going to spend 10 minutes explaining it. <laughs> so go find a nerdy friend to explain it or just trust that we got it right. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, in terms of scientific accuracy, uh, as I said, everything in the book is uh, true to, to real-world science, and all the technology that exists in, it, in the book is uh, real-world technology that that really exists or is just kind of the next gen version of it. No, no completely new lines of technological development. So like for instance, the Hermes is an ion engine powered uh, craft, uh, but there are no ion engines in the world that have the kind of output that Hermes' engines have. So that's like a next gen kind of thing. It's one of those things that, yes, we know roughly how to go about making those, but we never have. Um, same thing with the oxygenator. Right now, the closest thing in the real world to the oxygenator is the MOXIE experiment that'll be going to Mars on the Mars 2020 probe, which will actually collect carbon dioxide from Mars' atmosphere and strip off the carbons to, to produce oxygen. And that'll be great. But, um, but it just does it in extremely small quantities, and it's just a proof of concept. So it, it's like that. It's like the technology exists, but in, in some cases, I, I ran it forward a bit. Um, also, I will admit that there are two places where I did some serious hand-waving. Um, first off, uh, I just, and, and this is a big one, I just uh, magically ignored the problems associated with radiation in deep space. Uh, both Hermes and the HAB, and the, the rovers, the EVA suit, they're all said in the book to be radiation shielded. But I don't bother to explain how that could be. In real life, if you wanted to shield yourself from radiation to bring it down to like, you know, Earth normal background radiation levels, You'd need, uh, you know, if you're on the surface of Mars, you'd need something like 10 centimeters of water or a full meter of rock or several centimeters of lead. I mean, it, it's it's a big deal, and it's one of the biggest problems, I'm sure most of you know, one of the biggest problems that needs to be solved for interplanetary travel. And so I just came up with this hand-wavy magical material that takes care of the problem because I had these kind of cinematic visions. I didn't want it to be just like a you know, a hab that's completely buried in dirt. I wanted it to be more vulnerable. So I made that concession to, uh, to accuracy. Um, so that's, that's one ma kind of magical technology that they have invented between now and when it takes place. The other thing, of course, is that uh, the storm, the sandstorm at the beginning, could not possibly do the kind of damage that's depicted in the story. 
Mars's atmosphere is well, 0.6% of Earth's atmospheric density, and uh, 150 kilometer an hour wind on Mars feels like a one mile an hour breeze on Earth. It wouldn't damage anything. Uh, I had a different I had a different opening in mind uh, that would be scientifically accurate, where they're doing an MAV engine test and there's an explosion that causes all the damage and the problems, and there's a fuel leak, and now they have a limited amount of time to launch before they actually run out of fuel and so on. I decided against it because it's a man versus nature story, and I wanted nature to get the first punch in. And most people don't know about the realities of Mars's atmosphere. Um, <laughs> I'm talking to a crowd that almost certainly does. <laughs> but in the general population, um, most people don't know it. So uh, the other thing I was going to say about uh, um, scientific accuracy, I'm pretty proud of myself on this, is that I, I really like orbital dynamics. I'm a fan of astrodynamics and, and uh, basically slinging, right? Working out orbital trajectories and paths. I find it really interesting. I, I like... I like it when there's a, a small set of rules that seem simple, and then once you start analyzing it, it gets incredibly complicated. I like that sort of stuff. And so I wanted the, the path they took to get to Mars and back to be scientifically accurate and reasonable. So I, I wrote software to calculate the orbital trajectories that Hermes takes to get from Earth to Mars and then back uh, from Mars to Earth. And just everything Hermes does is accurate uh, for a ship that can accelerate at two millimeters per second per second. Now that's a pretty beefy acceleration for an ion powered craft. Like I said, it's next gen technology, but it all works out, which was cool because it forced me to choose a launch window. I'm like, okay, well, it's gonna do this. Now I need to pick a, a window where Earth and Mars are a certain you know, angle difference apart. And then, so that forced me to choose a launch window and I needed, for plot reasons, I needed their original mission plan to have them on Mars for Thanksgiving of that year, whatever year it is. And so I ended up having, you know, extra constraints that, you know, even a, a space agency wouldn't have, you know, because it had to be on Thanksgiving. And so um, I found a launch window and that, that was in, in 2035. And one cool thing was that a, uh, a guy who works at JPL, his name is Kenny Ray, um, from information scattered around in the book was able to back calculate the exact launch date, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Um, because of course, once I, once I knew the launch date, uh, I knew, you know, for every, for every moment that took place in the book, I could tell you the real world date. So um, all the transmission times between Mars and Earth that are depicted in the story, those are the real transmission, those are the real like radio transmission latencies that will be on that date. And so uh, Kenny Ray was able to use them, plus the knowledge of one Thanksgiving, that Thanksgiving was on Sol 16 and so on. And, and he was able to calculate, okay, it had to be 2035. And since Thanksgiving is Sol 16 and it was 124 days to get to Mars, that means the launch date is blah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's it for my kind of uh, direct presentation. I think I'll uh, answer questions now from the audience. If someone would be kind enough to relay them to me. Ah, Dr. Zubrin, excellent. I'm <laughs> not going to ask the first question, uh, although I'll tell you, you don't need to be so apologetic about the radiation. It's not that big a showstopper on the way to Mars. <laughs> okay. The, uh, okay. But anyway, uh, if, why don't uh, people who want to ask questions come up here? Line up at this mic. No, no, just come on up here. That way Andy can see them. Okay, we don't need to run around the room. Let's just line up right here. Andy, I hope you have a happy sequel. I'm assuming you have a happy ending, a happy sequel in which Mars Direct and all the equipment works well and no one is injured or not, and nothing is damaged. Uh, no sequel in mind. It's not really a sequelable story. <laughs> all right. Next. Hi, Andy. I just, uh, I just read your book this week because I thought it would be a good thing to do for tonight. Um, very good, loved it a lot. And uh, I have one question, how did you, or what led you to pick your landing sites? Obviously Pathfinder being a part of the book was important, but the, uh, the other, the Ares 4 site I thought was interesting. And what, what was your thought process in picking those landing sites? Well, um, each landing site had plot reasons. Um, I wanted the Ares 3 site to be within um, a reasonable distance of Pathfinder so I could have that plot event. And then I wanted Ares 4 to be a good, solid distance away from Ares 3, 
uh, so you could do the big ground traverse, but not unreasonably far away. So I tried to pick locations that I thought scientists would be interested in that match those criteria. So I thought that uh, the um, kind of former floodplains and former ocean floor that is Acidalia planitia would be somewhere that scientists would be interested in, in examining. And then the deepest part of uh, Schiaparelli Crater or Schiaparelli tra Crater or however you want to pronounce it. I've never gotten a solid answer on that, by the way. <laughs> um, the deepest part of Schiaparelli Crater would, is, is an impact that dug so deep into Mars's crust that pretty much the only deeper spots are in the Grand Canyon of Mars, which would be uh, pretty eventful and challenging to do a landing in. So, so that's why I chose those spots. Hi, Andy. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, the first question for you is, did you, did you ever travel to a desert-like situation to try to get in the mentality of what it would look like, other than seeing pictures? And number two, um, when the movie was made, uh, can you tell us where their Martian sites were? Yeah. Um, so first off, no, I never, I never went to a desert specifically to research the book. I mean, I've been to deserts in the past, but I've never not specifically for the book. Uh, mostly my inspiration was just like looking at pictures of Mars itself, like, you know, from probes and stuff like that. Um, as for the uh, filming locations, they were all in, uh, for the exterior shots, that play, playing the part of Mars is Wadi Rum, Jordan. Wadi Rum is a desert in Jordan. If you do a Google image search on it, you'll see exactly why they chose it to be Mars. I mean, it, it, it's Mars. I mean, you look at it, all, all, all they had to do in the film was they literally just filmed it and then they just needed to digitally change the sky to be red pretty much and then they had to do like they have to digitally remove the occasional bush or sh shrub or like tire tracks or something but it really looks like Mars <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. hi Andy you said there's a Amazon Kindle version of the book I want to ask is there also a Barnes and Noble Nook version of the book I can get yes yes well now yes there's a Barnes and Noble version, uh, Kindle, uh, and of course, uh, you know, physical copies. Thank you. Hey, Andy, this is Kent Nebergall. I, before you became famous, I was getting ready for a Mars Desert Research Station expedition, and one of my crew members sent me your book uh, via Amazon, and we were reading it back and forth, and we emailed you and said, have you ever been there? Because everything was so realistic, and Every so often I'd be reading it and say, well, that's going to screw them over. And then I'd turn the page and it's like, well, that just screwed me over. Uh, would you ever consider going to Mars Desert Research Station or would that be too much like work? Uh, I, I didn't catch the question. I said, would you ever consider going to a Mars analog station or would that be too much like work? I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm having a tough time. Could, uh, would you ever care to come to the Mars Desert Research Station? We're actually having a shindig there promoting your book in September. Why don't you come? in Utah. To Utah? Like me personally? No. <laughs> I, I write about brave people who experience hardship. I don't want to be one of them. <laughs> but thanks. Okay. Anyway, next. Uh, do you mention any indigenous Martian life? Do you mention any native Martian life. Oh, native Martian life. Uh, no, well, there's, there's none of that in the book. They, they don't discover life on Mars. Um, the main thing is, uh, in a story, you get one big coincidence. The, uh, the reader will accept one really unlikely thing. So if, uh, you know, this is a story about a guy who gets stranded on Mars. The reader will accept that. But for a guy to get stranded on Mars and then by coincidence also happen to be the guy who first discovers life on Mars, that's too much coincidence. So I decided against that. And it wasn't necessary for the story anyway. Um, it, it, it would have been, it would have seemed kind of cheesy and superfluous, my opinion. Uh, hey, Andy. Uh, Hi. Great. Hi. <laughs> Great book, by the way. Um, I noticed uh, in reading it that there's a little bit of like science self-deprecation where like a NASA administrator would be like, oh, like the engineer geeks or whatever. And, and uh, the protagonist, which in the heat of the moment, I've forgotten his name, 
uh, he also says, like, oh, my boring math says this, you know. <laughs> are, are you, did you choose to do that to, like, kind of appeal to a wider audience, or was this just kind of snark, or I'm wondering, <laughs> I'm wondering it's, where I came it, from. Thank you. It's, it's all snark. Um, I, was, I, thought it might have been. I was never attempting to appeal to a wider audience. Um, I had no idea that a wide audience would ever w would be interested at all. So yeah, and it's just, I mean, basically, uh, especially with the main character, Mark Watney, I, I, uh, he's based on my own personality, and I'm a smart ass. So, um, but he's a, he's a better version of me. He, he's, he's all the things I like about myself, and none of the things that I don't like about myself. He's what I wish I were, right? And I think you'll find that any, uh, any main character in a book is someone the author wants to be or someone the author wants to have sex with, pretty much. <laughs> and uh, just for the record, I want to be Mark Watney. <laughs> Hi, Andy. Liam Nye from the Penn State Lunar Lion team. I just wanted to know, what are your thoughts on Mars One? Uh, Mars One. Um, I, don't, I don't really take Mars One seriously. Um, I don't. I don't think that they that they will accomplish anything resembling their goals. Um, they've only built up about four hundred thousand bucks worth of funding so far as I know, and that's not enough money to colonize Nebraska, let alone Mars. <laughs> um, however, uh, people have said harsh things about them, like saying, "Oh, they're a scam," or or stuff like that. I don't think they're a scam. I think they're true believers who just aren't very realistic and have convinced themselves that reality TV money can fund a Mars mission. And I do think they actually serve a purpose to the greater goal of advancing mankind toward Mars in that they are a, a think tank and that they sit around and they think up scenarios and ideas and, and uh, they put effort into the kind of intellectual pursuits of, you know, how, how could you do this? And so I, I really do think they serve a purpose, but I don't think it's even remotely realistic when they say that they're gonna go to Mars. Hi Andy, this is Vera. I just emailed you 10 minutes before yes, this you event. Me, like, <laughs> Thank you so much for responding. So uh, I'm, it's really a bummer that you're in LA and I'm here. Uh, so I'm running the LA chapter of Mars Society and uh, also the Spaceport LA. And uh, the fact that we are uh, organizing a private screening for your movie and uh, oh, yeah? that you are in LA. Uh, right now, when I'm not there, <laughs> we will we will uh, uh, correspond about that later. But uh, what was uh, what was the message that you get from watching the movie if it was not written by yourself? Oh well, it was. Um, it's still like the the basic premise of the book is intact. It's still everybody will work hard to save one person who's in trouble and it's this really kind of in my opinion positive view of humanity and that really is by the way my view of humanity i really do think that just you know basically that 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 bit at the end of the book where where i talk about you know kind of the what humanity is really like i really do believe in that and just you know it's easy to get cynical or depressed when you read the news but for every for every person out there doing bad things, there's a thousand people out there just trying to help each other out. You just don't hear about them on the news because it's presumed normal, common human behavior. So, are there additional uh, questions? Any? All right. Well, uh, how about we vote to make Andy an honorary member of the Mars Societies? You. What the hell? Let's make him a real member. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you, you very much, Andy. This has been great. Uh, thank you. All right. Maybe we'll see you in Los Angeles at some event sometime. Well, I actually live up in the Bay Area. I'm okay, better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for having me in. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this little talk. All right. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. All right.
So, okay. Let's see. We have a poster here. Um, and uh, this, is it visible? Hey, can someone tell me where this? Uh, Carrie, where's the poster? Where is the poster? All right, get the other one. All right, while they're doing that. All right, just, all right. Um, all right, so this could be a big help for us uh, in terms of putting Mars on people's minds, getting people to look up, getting people to have a sense uh, once again of, of the sort of things we can do, uh, you know, I am hoping that this movie will have the same uh, impact, if you will, or, or success as Apollo 13. Um, Apollo 13 was also a story of human beings venturing out into space and using their grit and their wit and figuring out how to deal with the situation. And, you know, it was a can-do movie. Now, that was looking back to the past, okay? And, uh, you know, it had one, unfortunately, uh, on the downside, an element of nostalgia, looking back saying, hey, we were hot then, look at that. But still, there it was. Now, this is looking to the future. This is a fictional situation, but a realistic situation, and it says the same thing. And so I'm hoping that this could, could help us. Now, but we're gonna have to help ourselves and um, taking advantage of that, but we've got the following situation. You know, uh, American manned space program is adrift. And um, it, it is ironic. The, the robotic space program has been a tremendous success. And especially if you saw, uh, among others, Carol Stoker's talk last night where she went through the results coming in from a, a multitude of directions from the various robotic rovers and orbiters mostly um, in terms of this finding and that finding suggesting uh, uh, you know, the possibility, the probability of life just to take one of them alone, the, the intermittent methane puffs, okay? What is that? If, if it's intermittent, it has to be a local source. If it's global, it wouldn't be on and off, on and off. It has to actually even be near Curiosity, okay? So there is methane being puffed out of the ground near Curiosity. Now, what could be the source of that? There's only two possible sources. Either it's life, it's biogenic methane, or it's hydrothermal methane. And if it's hydrothermal methane, it's revealing a location which could be life or where life could live. So we have either found life or a habitable environment that should be investigated for life. That's just one of many findings. There's all these other ones. Nitrates, glaciers at, uh, just underground at mid-latitudes being a source of water, you know, so forth. One could go on and on. And, and yet, with all this stuff out there, you know, you got the human exploration program. So what should we do? Maybe what we ought to do is bring a rock to lunar orbit and go visit it. You know, we could get the rock from deep space or maybe we could take it from a rock quarry and put it in lunar orbit and visit it. I mean, the, the, you know, it's directionless. It needs to be given direction. And, you know, the American people support the space program, not because of what it is doing currently, but on the basis of what they once saw it do, and the hope that that will continue and somehow we will get from there, the moon landing, to the Star Trek future, and somehow what it's doing in between is, is, is steps along the way. All right? They have faith in that. But the space program as it is, is trying their patience. 
by dawdling and dawdling and, and delaying, and eventually the patients will run out, okay, if, unless this thing is put on track. Now, we have an opportunity to put it on track because there's an election, and the political class is putting themselves out on parade. They're putting themselves out in public where they can be reached, okay, where they can be met personally at shopping malls and church socials and bingo parlors and donut shops and, you know, and, 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 and county fairs and whatever, and, 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 and we've got to go see them. We've got to go talk to them, and we've got to tell them that we want to have a space program that's going somewhere, not just somewhere, but the right place, to Mars. That this is the challenge that you know, the American space program has basically been shirking for 40 years. We went to the moon, we're supposed to go to Mars after that. But instead, we just turned the program off. Um, that this is not acceptable. And it's not acceptable for them to tell us that we can no longer do the kinds of things we used to do. That, you know, yes, we were a great country once. If you want proof of that, go look in the Air and Space Museum, but don't look in the newspapers. Okay? All right. You got to tell them we want a country whose great deeds are celebrated not just in museums, but in newspapers. Okay? And, you know, look, right? I mean, look, America stands for something. And, uh, you know, that, that, that Statue of Liberty sitting in New York Harbor. Okay, holding her light forth. You know, we today mostly regard that statue through Emma Lazarus's poem of welcoming people to America, and that's true and that's good. But in fact, the original concept was liberty shining her light to the world. That's the name of the statue, actually. Shining her light to the world. That's why she's facing east towards Europe, holding that light up. Which, by the way, we had recently invented electric light at the point when that statue was uh, created among many other inventions that we were famous for. Um, but, you know, we got to show that light right now. I mean, look, the principle that we stand for that we're supposed to be shining forth is being challenged right now. Other societies, the, 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 uh, other types of political systems are challenging us, saying that they represent the future. There's Putin, there's China, there's the Islamists, all these people who reject liberty. They say, no, that doesn't work. You know, Putin says liberty leads to license, you know. You have liberty and homosexuals take over the world. You have China saying, oh, you have liberty, your economy will collapse, you can't go anywhere. You, you know, I don't know what the Islamists say, but they don't like it either. And the, uh, okay, um, uh, you know, Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon. Why we're going to go to the moon? We are going to astound the world with what free people can do. And we did. Okay? We need to do that again. We need to astound the world with what free people can do. And the space program can be a major part of that, should be a major part of that, must be a major part of that. Okay? And that's a reason for people right now, the, the political class, to give the space program a mission and to show the American people that they have not accepted, you know, that, that, that we have entered the age of limits, the age of American decline, that we are no longer the kind of people we used to be. Okay, no longer prepare to take the kind of risks or undertake the, 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 the challenges of the magnitude that we used to undertake, that we're no longer the kind of people who built this country and gave us everything we have as a result of their efforts. You know, and, 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 and you know, frankly, that that is something that we cannot accept. That is something this country cannot afford. So we have to go forth and do that. So we're going to do a political mobilization. We're going to launch an operation, we call it Operation President, okay? which is to systematically get Mars Society chapters to go out and meet with these presidential aspirants wherever they show up, wherever we can find them, in Ohio, uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, yes, but all, Colorado, uh, you know, Wisconsin, uh, everywhere, Pennsylvania, uh, lots of places. Wherever you are, they're coming. Um, we got to do that. We also want to mobilize chapters to meet with the supporting cast, the congressmen, the senators, especially the congressmen, are actually easy to meet with. Okay, your chapter, call up the congressional office. You say, we want to meet with you in your home office. Who are you? We're the Mars Society. We want to talk to you about giving the American space program a goal. You know, we're paying for a space program. We want to have one. Um, the, you know, and the, the, so, and because space is not a, um, a partisan issue. 